Who can tell me what the classes of blood vessels are? What does that mean? Arteries, veins, and the venules, capillaries. Yep, that's where you got the classes. So on the artery side, what are the two main classes of arteries that we're gonna that we that are important? Elastic and muscular. So where are elastic arteries and why are they elastic? What's what's their benefit? Excellent. Fantastic. So we know they're closest to the heart, where the most of the surges are taking place. They're elastic, so they can distend when a new surge of blood shows up in them. And then their recoil allows for continuous flow between beats. So it's sort of letting that move, move keep moving the blood forward when the heart's not pushing it, because now the heart's busy getting the next batch of blood. So the, these elastic arteries are continuing to send blood forward. So they are like your aorta, all the ones we're gonna look at the cadaver, all the big ones, those are all just big elastic arteries. Now we're gonna group the next two categories. We'll call them muscular arterioles and put those kind of together as one group. What is the main thing about muscular arterioles that's important for our overall body? Blood pressure. They what? Help to create a continuous flow. Fantastic. So first and foremost, the, we'll call the muscular arterioles are going to be the determinant of blood pressure. They also will be um, moving pulsatile to steady flow. And also across these arter arterioles, we are going to have a significant drop. Um, so we're going to do a decrease in blood pressure. Why is it important that we want to have steady flow at a lower blood pressure when we leave the arterioles? Excellent. So we don't damage the capillaries. Why are the capillaries more likely to be damaged than the arterioles? They're getting the surges one cell layer thick. So they're very, very thin, very fragile. We don't want to cause any rupturing. We don't want to cause any additional pressure, which would drive the extra fluid out, which would cause edema. So we want to make sure we keep the integrity of our capillaries. Those are good. Okay. What about, what is the unique feature of the venules and veins? Yep, see that? <laughs> see that? <laughs> valves, they've got valves inside. So they have valves that blood can go up, but if blood's gonna like come down for any reason, you stood up abruptly or there's higher pressure downstream, the valves will close and it's not gonna go any further back. Then every time you squeeze your legs around it, the muscle pump will always just squish it up ahead, move forward. If the valves don't meet because they're distended, what condition would somebody have? Varicose veins, exactly, class of vessels. Elastic arteries, well, they have more elastin, they're more distensible, continuous flow, have more recoil. The muscular arterioles are gonna have a greater proportion of smooth muscle. They're more smooth muscle in the what layer? Tunica, Tunica media, than the larger ones are. Now, technically, if you're gonna scrape off the smooth muscle, say from the aorta, Quantitatively, there's going to be more in mass than one smaller arterial. Relatively, for your lumen, you might have like this much muscle, like almost as wide as the lumen is on some arterials, where the aorta, the aorta could be this big, but the muscle would be barely as big as where my finger is. So relatively, so the, you're really not going to get a huge diameter change on the larger elastic arteries where the smaller ones, it'll have a profound difference in the overall diameter change based on the contraction or dilation of that smooth muscle. Okay, so then that's really what I wanted you to know in terms of structure, function, components of the class of vessel. Um, so capillary structure and function. You guys already identified that capillaries are one cell layer thick. It's made only of what? The tunica 
intima, also known as endothelium. Yep. <laughs> so the endothelium and the tunica and the intima. So what are the two types of capillaries? Continuous and fenestrated. And so fenestrated are just in these specialized areas. Choroid plexus makes rubble spinal fluid, um, liver and kidneys for filtering. Otherwise, pretty much everything's just a continuous capillary. So in the continuous capillaries, one cell layer thick is ideal to allow for diffusion. So we have diffusion, say you have a higher concentration of oxygen in the blood and less out in the tissues. So just by concentration gradient, you get to a place where um, the oxygen in the blood senses that there's less out, it's just gonna unload and head on out. Likewise, carbon dioxide is formed in the tissues, it's gonna wanna come into the blood. So when we deal with the blood, actually the respiratory system, we'll talk more about that. So you've got diffusion taking place, but you also have filtration. So just the pressure, about 30 millimeters of mercury is the pressure of blood in the capillaries, and it's helping to push out through hydrostatic pressure, helping some of this exchange. We have something coming up, and I didn't really talk a lot about, it's called vasomotion. So pre-capillary sphincters that sort of help open up or shut down flow in certain capillary beds, they can actually open and close quite frequently and cause little micro surges that help the filtration um, within the capillary bed. So that's just what vasomotion refers to. So the capillary bed structure I wanted to mention is really referring to some terminology. Who can tell me what collaterals are? Collateral arteries. Fantastic. More than one feeding into a capillary bed. So if you have one that's going to obstruct, you have like a couple side routes that will actually get in. So that capillary bed isn't SOL because the one feeding is going to be blocked. So that is only stimulated by exercise. What are anastomoses? So a direct link straight from artery straight over to veins. And so it's skipping a capillary bed. It's really intended not to bypass a capillary bed, but be as an overflow. So the capillary still gets its blood, but if the pressure's too high or the volume's too great, it's this other chute for it to go through to sort of alleviate the strain on the capillary bed, but they can indeed turn pathological and they can be these inadvertent shunts is what they call them. So when you have perfectly good oxygenated blood heading straight over to the veins that you're not getting the benefit of. So they can um, be pathological. Most of the time in clinical medicine, when you hear about anastomoses, it's often in that context. But there are many normal anastomoses just meant as an overflow valve. Um, and we talked about vein pressure is just low. So say you're going to go from like the 20s and then all the way to zero at the vena cava at the point of the right atrium. So it's kind of our driving pressure. So then I'm just going to go here to the hemodynamics and we'll pretend it says, do you know? So as far as the hemodynamics, this one was the hard part from the other day. So a lot of variables and things kind of swirling around in our heads. So blood flow variables and resistance parameters. This just says what determines flow. So if you're going to have flow through a vessel, okay, a little vessel here. We're going to determine, so flow through this vessel determines how much pressure you're gonna put in here. So pressure, you can call it driving pressure. We talked about the other day, same how high, high pressure on one end, low pressure on the other hand, that just means, okay, that's the direction it's gonna go. And then that is flow, but what are the things that's gonna oppose it that might get in the way would be <coughs> resistance. And so what flow is, is really the balance between how hard we're pushing blood through and what we're doing to be in the way. So what are some of the factors of resistance? There's three that you should know. There's only one that we can vary um, with consistency in the body. But just as just a general principle, what are the three factors of resistance? Yes. So length. H, length, we can't do anything about that. Viscosity. Viscosity, um, that can change a little bit, but that's like the sludginess of your blood or of the water. Is it really watery or is it really thick and syrupy? And um, diameter or radius. 
So these things are gonna be like either you're pinching this off or it's longer and there's just more drag or there's just sludgier blood. So there's all things that's gonna get in the way. And then pressure, if you have any of these, you need to have more and more pressure to overcome it. So ultimately, if we have changed our diameter and radius in our body um, and we have vasoconstriction, that we actually take our blood vessel and actually made our blood vessel smaller, so it came in inward, so then now we change our diameter, well, we're gonna have to tell the heart, you're gonna have to push a lot harder, and that's what blood, high blood pressure is all about. So blood flow, so we have increasing pressure is what's going to have to be what overcomes any resistance we throw at it. So changing the diameter, usually reducing it, increases blood pressure because our heart has to work harder because the cells over here are going, hey, there's resistance, we need more blood. And if resistance is gonna get in the way, it feeds back to the heart to say, drive harder, push harder. So that's really the basic elements of high blood pressure. For the purposes here, those are just factors that you should be aware of. There's either driving pressure or there's resistance parameters. Arterial blood pressure value and meaning. So if we have our arterial pressure waveform, we have systolic, diastolic blood pressure, pulse pressure, mean arterial pressure. Those are things that you should know. So what would this portion be? We, this one's going to be your diastolic blood pressure. And this one up here would be your systolic blood pressure. What does diastolic blood pressure tell us? What information about our body is it telling us? Yes. Pressure of the left ventricle to open the aortic semilunar valve. Systolic blood pressure tells us what? The peak ventricular pressure, yes. So that's how the maximum pressure that our heart developed. Okay, what is pulse pressure? Yes, so pulse pressure is the difference between the two. So if we have somebody with a blood pressure of say 180 over 100, they might not be doing all that well, but their diastolic blood pressure is what? 100, so we have that right here. Systolic blood pressure is 180, and then the pulse pressure would be 81 millimeters of mercury, yep. Okay, so then this next one for mean arterial pressure, this gives us the pressure from for one cardiac cycle. So it takes into consideration the duration of the cycle that's actually the pressures are getting lower. So the mean arterial pressure is gonna be our diastolic blood pressure, which is gonna be in this case 100 plus in this case, we'll have 80, which is our pulse pressure, divided by 3. So we don't have to go further. On your test, I'll have some number divisible by 3. But you'll figure this out, and that will be the mean arterial blood pressure. Factors that affect tissue perfusion. So if we have a blood vessel going to cells, that's the tissue. Perfusion means blood flow. So what are factors? We have our heart, the cardiac output, that's how much blood we're sending out. Also our blood pressure, that's how much pressure we're driving to it to get to the cells. And what is the other one? Resistance. So even though these ones are helping it go, also resistance is also what would potentially block it. So that's a factor. Again, that, so it's again the same thing just put in a different way. Who can tell me where the barrel reflex is located? 
It's in the carotid sinus, which is where the common carotid artery that we're gonna talk about today bifurcates into the internal and external carotid arteries. It's at the base of our jaw. It's called the cor or carotid sinus, um, and we have baroreceptors there. So a baroreceptor is, what does baro mean? Pressure. pressure. So it's like a pressure sensor is located here. So the baroreflex is the response of when this receptor or sensor is triggered. So if the baroreceptor is triggered because there's really high pressure, what is the reflex action going to be? Heart rate's gonna drop and are we gonna vasodilate systemically so blood will stay down here and less is driven up. If there is low pressure going to the brain, like if you've been laying down and you sit up abruptly and all of a sudden there's the baroreflexes sense really low pressure, what will the reflexive action be? Increase heart rate and massive vasoconstriction. Yep, and it's gonna help drive more blood up there. Tell me the blood pressure hormones that are, that will help to increase blood volume. Okay, aldosterone and antidiuretic. Okay, aldosterone comes from where? The next one is the posterior pituitary, yeah. But I'm only writing the adrenal cortex because this comes into play in a little bit. Okay, which hormone is going to increase directly blood pressure? Yes. Angiotensin 2. So angiotensin 2 does it because it's actually causing, it's targeting receptors on the endothelium that's going to then tell the smooth muscle of the muscular arterioles to constrict. And then that's a direct increase in blood pressure. That is literally thumb over the end of the hose. Now water's going to shoot out more. So that's exactly what angiotensin 2 does. Aldosterone antidiuretic hormone, if you're holding a hose, and you're watering your yard, is just you turning up the faucet. And water comes out more because you just increase the volume. Now it's gonna be more. So it does increase pressure, but it starts it by increasing volume. So, and we're gonna come back into here. So what we have here is how do we get angiotensin II? Where, so obviously if angiotensin II increases blood pressure, it starts by a decrease of blood pressure. But where are the sensors that's going to tell, we're, be worried about it? In the kidneys. Yep, so we're going to draw a kidney here. The kidney, this is a ureter going down. So if the kidney senses low blood pressure, it will send out, let me get some more colors on over here. It's going to send out renin. It's going to send out renin and it's going to send it up through the inferior vena cava to the heart. But does it go to the heart as renin? What does it do? So it combines with angiotensinogen and together those guys make angiotensin one or just plain old angiotensin without the one but now that's what's going through the inferior vena cava it makes its way up to the heart so we have angiotensin one angiotensin one going into the heart right side of the heart that sends it off into the lungs. So angiotensin one goes up into the lungs to both sides of the lungs. Switch this one over here. Do this a little bit better. So we're gonna send 
angiotensin one into the lungs. And then what's gonna happen? We're gonna turn into angiotensin two, but how do we flip it into angiotensin? Yes, so we have angiotensin converting enzyme, and now angiotensin one is going to become angiotensin two. So angiotensin two now makes it back to the left side of the heart. Once it's in the left side of the heart, the left ventricle contracts, sends it out the aorta, and all over the body. So it's a pretty quick conversion. You go from low blood pressure in the kidney, sends out renin, that bunch of blood makes it to the heart. So you're within a couple heartbeats of blood now going out, distributing throughout the whole body with one of our most potent vasoconstrictors of the tunica media of our muscular arterial. So you have rapid increase in blood pressure. But that's not the end of the story. So not only does angiotensin II increase blood pressure by targeting, we're going to say, muscular arterioles. I'm going to be really specific, the tunica media, because that's the smooth muscle part that's going to cause vasoconstriction. Let's sit here and go vasoconstriction. But it also will then target, I'm just going to draw in pink here, a really extra giant one just to emphasize it's not really that big. This is the adrenal gland, but we're going to do the cortex. So angiotensin II will also target, let me put angiotensin II, targets the adrenal cortex, and that's what tells aldosterone to get released. And then aldosterone is going to increase blood volume, which then increases blood pressure. So angiotensin II increases blood pressure first directly by vasoconstriction of those arterioles, and secondly, by the release of aldosterone, which it's going to increase blood volume. So not only did you make a smaller pipe, but now you add it. So it's the same thing as in your yard. You turn up the faucet and you put your thumb over the hose. And now you have high pressure. So that's why angiotensin is such a potent um, increaser of blood pressure. So the two most effective medications for hypertension or antihypertensives are going to be what? ACE inhibitors, because now we're going to block the conversion. So we're going to reduce the amount of angiotensin II that's even made. And what's the other family of, hormone, of drugs? ARBs, yep, A-R-B, angiotensin receptor blocker. So when angiotensin II is circulating around, going to the adrenal gland or going to the muscular arterioles, normally it would fit in a receptor and then make it happen. But if an ARB gets there first and plugs up the receptor, angiotensin II is going around, has nothing to do. So it's not effective. So that's why ARBs are so popular. So we're going to deal with the arterial system and the venous system. I'm going to just draw the arterial system on the board as we go through. The venous system is important. If I'm going to like balance it out, I'd say two-thirds arterial, one-third venous. So the arterial system is definitely more important, but since 90% of the terms that we're using for the arteries are going to match for the veins, it just makes the drawings a lot messy. And since my drawings are really, you know, let not even the envy of preschoolers. That's kind of where we're at here. So just know we'll talk about the veins and I encourage you on your own, the best way to really learn these is to just get a blank piece of paper, draw your dead body outline, and then start from there. Do a little oval, like here's the heart. Okay, we're branching off here. We're gonna and get lots of different colors. You want different colors of like every time that there's a branch or a name change, change the color. Some of the vessels or many of the vessels that we're gonna talk about today will be just the continuation, sort of like name, like whoever named the roads here in Prescott might have been related to the person that named the vessels. Because, you know, it'd be like you're on one road, we talked about White Spar Road, 
and then you know you're driving along and then next thing you're like don't turn off the road just going along and next you're like i'm on montezuma now it's called montezuma and then you just keep going and then obviously you're like well now it's whipple i didn't even turn off i just kept going and then it's sort of like arbitrarily from one area to the next it now has a new name and so that's what we're going to be doing with it sometimes they change the name because it was a, a branch off sometimes it just changes the name because now it's in the next the next section but the the vessel looks like exactly the same from one point to the other so just keep that in mind and that's why we'll be drawing them in different colors just to mark these sort of segment changes this first one where it's pretty easy we already know this these ones from the heart so exiting the heart we have that pulmonary artery and we have the aorta arteries leaving and then what's bringing blood back into the heart? The right side, we have the superior and inferior vena cava coming into that right atrium, or we have the pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium. So those kind of go without saying a bit, so we won't put that so much on here. So again, with the superior and inferior vena cava, we have the aortic arch here, we have the pulmonary veins coming in there. Okay, here's our heart. Drawing it like my little oval. From here, I think I'll do our pink. If the whole thing's called an aorta, so we can break it up into parts, is ascending aorta would be the first going up part. Then you have aortic arch, and you have descending aorta. It calls the descending aorta can also have a couple more names. You can have the first half above the diaphragm be thoracic aorta, and the descending aorta part that's under the diaphragm would be abdominal aorta. So there's, so here we have just ascending aorta is where you're coming off. We also see our left main and our right coronary arteries. So we're gonna talk about these first three branches coming off of the aorta. So the first branch we have over here, this one is gonna be known as the brachio cephalic trunk. Brachio means arm, cephalic means head. So it means any, all the blood that's going to be in this brachiocephalic trunk is either going to go to the arm or the head. Then the next branch is going to be going straight up and it's actually, for hearts here, this next branch is going to be our left common carotid. It lines up perfectly with the left side of our neck. And so it just, if you go down straight from the left side of your neck and you go down, that's just right where the arch is. And that's going to be your second main branch off. So we'll call this one right on here, left, the left common carotid artery. And then from that point on the third one coming off is going to stay under your clavicle. So it's going to be called the left subclavian artery. This is one of those times that you are definitely going to need to know right and left, and that needs to be included in naming of your vessel. And you definitely need to include an artery or vein. Left and right and artery and veins are the only two abbreviations that you can just do without having some sort of additional explanation. Left and right is usually a capital L or capital R. Artery and vein is usually a lowercase a or a lowercase v. So that's what we have going here. So that's here. So the aortic arch, we have the brachiocephalic trunk here, left common carotid, and the left subclavian. So from this brachiocephalic trunk, it actually goes to these other ones on the right side. The brachiocephalic trunk divides straight up into the right common carotid, as well as the right subclavian. So what I'd like to point out, if I use these colors here, so my blue and purple, if I had, so we had on the left side, our left common carotid and our left subclavian. The right side, it's the same, but because the heart is shifted left, we have a brachiocephalic trunk as a connector just to better align it so that we can then also have the same ones, the right common carotid or the right subclavian. So just that brachiocephalic trunk is just a way to even it up because of the off-center nature of the heart. So we'll continue on to the upper extremities. 
you guys recall from 201, axilla means your armpit. So the axillary artery is gonna go from, if you were to cut someone's arm off at the level of the torso, and your second cut would be, say, just past the deltoid muscle. Those would be your, the sort of start and end points for that axillary artery. On your slides, you'll notice that I just included right. You need it to the left as well, but it just was too confusing to put both of them and redundant and extra wordy. But I wanted to have where you knew where, how to write it properly. We're gonna do ulnar pinky side in, and our radical radius is outside thumb. So right radial artery and our right. They then meet down and you have this palmar arch where it actually connects. You have a deep palmar arch. And then this picture you can see where the axillary is in here. And there's my so if you were to cut off from the torso to the right would be subclavian. And then you can see at this point, now to the left is brachial. So the axillary artery really just takes place in this kind of portion that really matches underneath where perhaps the perspective, think of it as like a pie wedge and just your deltoid is the outer piece of it. And the axillary is just your um, armpit region. You can see here is the brachial artery and then it goes to the radial and the ulnar. And you can see the deep palmar arch there. You can see the radial and the ulnar. So as for the veins, I'm not gonna write more on this, but for the veins, I wanted you to see that we have, they're really matching. So if we're down here and now we're on the return trip, you would have a radial vein or an ulnar vein. And then you have a brachial vein. And then you have an axillary vein. And you have a subclavian vein. And we haven't gone in here, but it's just dealing with the arm. So they're just matching. But then I had to throw in a couple here only because they're more superficial. So anatomically, they're going to be greater reference points for you with a human body that's going to be intact and not the cut up ones that we have here. But I wanted you to really focus at least for us the deeper ones because on your exam and your lab practical, I may ask, I will ask you to describe the vessels like from the heart to a location and back again. So for instance, if the location is the thumb, then it would be like, okay, left. If I say right thumb, you'd say, okay, from the heart. Aorta, brachiocephalic trunk, right subclavian artery, right axillary artery, right artery right ulnar artery and then you can be like right ulnar vein right brachial vein right axillary vein right subclavian vein right brachiocephalic vein superior vein and cava in the heart so you're sort of naming it out and back but we also have these more superficial veins that you will probably need to know but they won't really fall in that directional narrative so as we go from the neck we have our common carotid arteries. So they're going up our right one and our left common carotid. And we've already talked about how it divides into our internal and external carotid arteries. So we have this one turning in in here or in here. So these would be our right or left internal carotid artery. Or we would have coming out here to the skull, outer skull and the face would be our external. So we have our left. So the vertebral that's here on their list is behind it. So it's like a little bit deeper into the board. So I'm gonna draw in black, but it's, you know, this is where it's having a two dimensional gets a little bit. So the vertebrals are kind of coming up behind and it, they end up coming up together, branching and becoming one single vessel. But cervical vertebrae had on their transverse process an extra hole in them. So that's where you can see in this example, the red is actually representing the vertebral artery that we're talking about now. And because the neck is small, it's hard to sort of fit all these things in, we tuck an artery in through those extra side holes of the cervical vertebrae, those vertebral foramen. Veins, there's no common. It's just external jugular coming from the outside, 
internal jugular coming from the inside. They both drop down to the subclavian or they're all kind of merging together. And then you also have the vertebral one coming down. So all the head stuff are coming down on their own. External jugular, internal jugular, and a vertebral vein come down, merge with the subclavian vein coming back in, and all together on both sides, they become brachiocephalic vein. The brachiocephalic veins come together to be the superior vena cava. You can see that here. You can see subclavian, subclavian. So those guys are coming out from the arm. So the axillary was where it was cut off. So you have subclavians coming in. You can see internal jugular and external jugular kind of dropping down from above. One's a lot wider than the other. So all three of them together. Now this squiggly green one, that's your brachiocephalic. So this is left brachiocephalic vein. This one's your right brachiocephalic vein. So the two brachiocephalics come together to be the superior vena cava. You can see that here. So here they have the jugulars coming in a lot more separately. Sometimes they fuse in really together. Sometimes there's, a, little, there's some, a lot of variation vascularly. So this would be a brachiocephalic. So notice on the venous side, no matter which side, right or left, you got to go through a brachiocephalic vein to get to the vena cava, superior vena cava. On the arterial side, because of the leftward shift of the heart, we only have a brachiocephalic trunk. So it's on the right side, but there's no right and left. There's just one on the right side. All right, sorry, this is really messy. And I like to draw this as we're going and not see the pre-draw because it looks like someone threw a bunch of colored spaghetti at the screen. So we'll try to work our way through it. We're gonna go through the brain arteries. I want you to know I'm making a distinction of the brain. There's just your basic, what are artery, which arteries are going to the brain in different parts of the brain. Then the other distinction I want you to make is, you would realize is there is a circle here. This circle is known as the circle of Willis. And it's a circle in that if you have an clot or obstruction on any one part, you can still get blood around from the other way. So it's a very advantageous anatomical feature. So I want you to know which vessels make up the circle, but also there's other vessels that are just going to different parts of the brain. So we're going to stick with some color coding. So if we have our vertebral arteries coming together to be the basilar artery, do this. Vertebrals coming up. So this here is our basilar. From the basilar, we're going to this artery that is the posterior cerebral. So I'm just gonna do like all these little branches off here that we don't really need to know, but it just goes to the back of the brain. If you guys remember cerebrum is the wormy part of the brain. So pretty much the back third of the brain is gonna be served by this posterior cerebral. This is all brain. But we're looking at the brain from the underneath side with it. So with this person, kind of laying down, sort of, but this would be coming forward. So this here will be, in this case, our left. So that's the green on here. Posterior cerebral coming around. Then it also goes to cere the cerebellar branches off. I'll just do this in another version of green because it just is more, it might come off sooner. It might come off up here but we have cerebellar stuff going on here. Now we're moving up into that circle, circle of Willis. So as we go forward here in the circle, we're coming up and we're coming up. So this here will be our, when it's not really serving a part of the brain, it's actually connecting to another vessel that will serve another part of the brain. So it's gonna be known as a communicating. So this one is going to be the left posterior communicating. Then we're gonna blast forward this posterior communicating artery to the front of the brain. And this is going to all its little vessels. So this front of the brain is gonna be served by what vessel do you think we should call this? Yep, left anterior 
It's going to the brain part, so it's cerebral. But then we have our eight connector here, and this one is, because there's just one, there's now two sides, this one is going to be anterior, communicating from our vertebrals, coming up our neck, at the base of the brain, in front of the medulla and pons, it comes together to become the basal or artery. As it branches off to go feed the back portion of the brain, whether it's gonna be the cerebellar or posterior cerebral, we're actually starting this circle. So the first part of this circle of Willis, if you will, is going to be the green guy, the posterior cerebral artery. And then it continues to feed the brain. But if we're in the circle, we move up to the posterior communicating artery, and there'll be a branch that comes off here and feeds the middle part of the brain, which we'll know this here as going to be the right middle cerebral artery. But those middle cerebral arteries are not part of the circle. They're just coming off of it. Right? They're just coming off to go feed the middle part of our brain. Because here in the abdomen, if we say, if I sort of draw a torso, I'm going to go here to legs. Our aorta is going to continue down. We'll draw some landmarks. We've got kidneys here. We have a spleen. Over here, say kidney. It's a kidney. We have a really tiny liver over here. It's bigger than that, but we'll sort of just space just kind of these things out and really in general. So the vessels that we are going to name coming down through the abdominal aorta here, the first branch coming off is this tiny little thing. It's the tiny little stump, a couple, like barely a centimeter long. So I'm just gonna draw it kind of off to the side. It really just comes forward. Um, it will immediately branch into three. So this little nub stump that I drew is the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk immediately divides into three vessels. The first, well, one of them being going to the spleen. So it's called splenic artery. Another one's gonna head on over here and it's going to the liver. So this one is going to be the hepatic artery. And then there's this other one that comes up and around and it's gonna go to the stomach and the stomach has some other vessels going, but this one happens to be known as the left gastric. You guys can see that on the slides. The celiac trunk is located there. We'll have the hepatic coming over that way, splenic coming over that way, and the left gastric is going to come off. So those are the three branches off of that tiny little celiac trunk. And then if we go here, we can see celiac trunk is right here. We have the hepatic artery going this way. They show the left gastric branching off a little bit later, but you have left gastric and the splenic. So just to let you know, it's really a short section, but divides into those three areas because the stomach, spleen, and liver are high up in the abdominal cavity. So it makes sense for it to branch off of the celiac trunk there. We come on down. We're just gonna hit the kidneys next. So if we go to the kidney, re left renal and right renal. So that's pretty decent. Renal means kidney, just like hepatic means liver. So once you've identified celiac trunk, first branch off of the aorta, right after the diaphragm, and the renal arteries go into the kidneys midway down, then the other two that you need to know are going to be the mesenterics. The word mesentery or mesenteric, you just want to think in your mind of guts, intestines. 
Superior mesenteric serves the upper portion. It's gonna be some of your large intestine and some of your small intestine. Inferior mesenteric is gonna serve the guts at the bottom. Some of it's gonna be large, some of it's gonna be small. Just lower guts, upper guts. So it's, so ultimately you have superior mesenteric coming from here and inferior mesenteric coming below it. One on either side of those renal arteries. Back to this picture, we can see that the superior mesenteric is coming off here and inferior mesenteric is coming off there. So they're just one, but then it branches to lots of little, you know, smaller feeders going into the gut. But what everything we've done here, so that stretch of aorta, we have celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, the renals, and inferior mesenteric artery. When you look at a diagram, you'll see other stuff coming off of it, but we're not naming those. So those are the ones we're naming. Celiac trunk's at the top, the renals are coming off the side, and the two mesenterics are gonna be crossing, you know, on straddling the renals, basically. And we're gonna divide here. These are known as the iliac arteries. The iliac artery is going to split. We have one branch going inward that's gonna serve our bladder, our reproductive organs, kind of dive down into our pelvis area. So this would be our right. So if we have the common iliac artery dividing into internal, the other one would be external iliac, Let's see what left. <laughs> so the internals are a more distinctive branch off, but if you're going from the common iliac, it's sort of like, again, the Prescott Road thing. It's kind of, you know, left common iliac just sort of becomes the left external iliac as it's heading out. I drew these dashed lines here. These dashed lines represent the inguinal ligament that you see here, which is showing the ligament. Where that goes, so if, where your legs are, if you, from where your torso is, where torso ends to where legs begin, so if you bend your leg, the fold of where your leg would be compared to your torso, that's roughly where the inguinal ligament is. And that point is really where your external iliac on one side, and you just kind of barely go under, it's like a bridge on a freeway. So on one side, you're going to be external iliac artery, and on the very other side, you're going to be femoral artery because you're gonna be in thigh territory. So then femoral artery we'll have here is gonna extend down. So here the left, kind of a little recap here. This is a nice drawing of the celiac trunk. You can see how tiny it is. And then immediately draw, goes the splenic artery, left gastric to the stomach or hepatic over to the liver. Well, they're going right back up. So where our descent in aorta is that we did all this crazy stuff with, Coming back up is just our inferior vena cava. You can see the renal veins draining right into it. It goes up. The hepatic portal vein, you don't need to worry about these other veins. I want you to know about the hepatic portal vein because it's our second of two portal systems. Do you remember what a portal system is or where our other portal system was? Yes, yeah, so our first portal system is the hypophysial portal system going from the hypothalamus, a little capillary bed there, sends out hormones that's now going to a second stop being at the anterior pituitary. So instead of a normal situation where you have an artery going to a place like a kidney and then just comes back by the vein straight back to the, to the heart. A portal system means you have blood that went to one capillary bed and now it's on its way back to the heart but it has another capillary bed it's going to stop at. So what's going on in this situation with the hepatic portal system is if we have, say, the aorta and through the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, what are we serving with those mesenteric arteries? Our intestines and our guts. So it's going to our guts and say we just ate some lunch. So now you have food, you might have like a roast beef sandwich in there, a salad, pizza, whatever. You're breaking down your carbs, your proteins, and your fats. And so you're going to absorb them. The carbs and the proteins are going to get into the blood. And you don't know what else maybe had been laced in your food. So your body's like, you know, I don't know that I want to go from our mesenteric veins straight to the vena cava and then the heart is the next stop. So all of those veins and stuff from the guts all collect together 
you see that kind of all here collect together. So they still have their own little mesenteric names and stuff and splenic veins, but they all merge together and they hit the liver first. So the liver has a chance to inspect, get rid of anything that maybe you ate, that you absorbed, that you don't want to circulate and you don't want your, to hit your heart. So the hepatic portal vein is gathering all your gut stuff, if you want to think of it that way, and bringing it to the liver. The liver cleans it, and now hepatic vein, just the vein from the liver, heads right over the vena cava, it's clean blood, and it's going to the heart. So that's what it's just all of the drainage from the abdomen, basically, is going to be running into the liver. You have our aorta. What's the, what did I just draw in blue? Yes, yeah, so our common iliacs, external iliac artery in our left. So we have our femoral artery, it's going to come down. So we have our right. So we go here from our femoral artery. Now I put in deep and superficial because you can see from the diagram up here how we have the main femoral artery coming down, but you can see there are these other branches. Our thighs, we've got so much musculature that we really want, we have a lot of branches of vessels coming off. It's the femoral proper that's just continuing on through. So I have those other listed just so you know, hey, there's other branches and they're pretty big and significant. We'll head on down here behind the knee to the popliteal artery. Then from the point of the popliteal artery, your lower leg, we have three vessels. Branch them off as we have the two tibials. One's gonna go to the front of the shin. One's gonna go to the back of the shin. So we have anterior tibial and posterior tibial. And then we have the peroneal or fibular. To whichever one you use. I learned it as peroneal, but the books now call it fibular. So it's going to be the fibula, so that's going to the side. So you've got one in the front, one in the back, and one on the side. And that's how they are. So it's a little hard to draw, so I'm telling you that now. So we'll have one to the front, and this one we can call left anterior tibial. And then one kind of went way to the back. So kind of draw it to the back which would be left posterior tibial. And then we have this sort of side branch over here, peroneal or fibular. So the veins coming back, posterior tibial and our anterior tibial, so the front and back of the lower leg, comes up, popliteal vein, femoral vein, and then we get in here, and I passed the slide, but we'll have left external iliac vein, left common iliac vein, and then ultimately to the vena cava, inferior vena cava. So the veins are really matching the arteries with the exception here of the saphenous, and that's because I wanted to make sure you knew about the saphenous because that is what's going on over on this side of the slide. So there is just really superficial, but I wanted you to know the saphenous is a very superficial collecting portion of our leg. It is the one that cardiologists or cardi um, will actually access and use as a bypass graft because it's so superficial, it's easy to get to. And so, and it's a bigger one. We have lots of return, venous return options. So it's okay to take a segment of vein. There will be some pooling and our body's gonna have to readapt to increasing some lymphatic drainage and actually increasing some other venous return mechanisms, but it is possible. So that's why veins are used for bypasses and not arteries. The last thing that we're going to go through is the fetal circulation. Blood goes to the placenta, gets to the placenta, absorbs oxygen. Now the umbilical vein, there's one of them, that comes back into the belly button Umbilical vein comes back in. This little donut looking thing on this picture is the belly button. From the inside of the belly button to the liver is going to be the ductus, ductus venosus. That's because the baby is bringing in oxygenated blood that got oxygenated at the placenta, also absorb nutrients from mom, but wants to filter, wants the liver to check out anything it's bringing in before it's gonna allow it to circulate.
So then the next point, this oxygenated blood leaves clean from the liver, goes into the right atrium, but there's a hole between the right atrium and the left atrium. That's the Fermanel Valley. So we go from the right atrium, blood will shift over to the left atrium. That is because the blood's already oxygenated. It does not need to go to the lungs to get oxygen in the fetus. And so the blood that returns to the right atrium, some of it's gonna drop down to the right ventricle, but now half of it's gonna head on over straight to the left side, so through the left ventricle and to the whole body. So that's the first bypass. Now the rest of the blood, so the other half of the blood went down to the right ventricle. When the right ventricle to the lungs, but we don't need all the blood to go to the lungs. So it's going to shoot up the pulmonary trunk and where it goes and divides to go to the right and left pul pulmonary arteries, that aorta you know, branches over it. Well, some of it's gonna go straight across, straight to the aorta. That's called the ductus venosus. It actually goes straight up there. So then half of the blood that left the right ventricle that would normally send out to the lungs, some of it's just gonna go straight to the aorta and out to the whole body because it's already oxygenated. So we're gonna say PA, pulmonary artery, to aorta. This here is depicting what? Ductus arteriosus, and it's right there. And then this one is depicting the foramenal valley. That's gonna be right in there. So it's crossing over from the right atrium to the left atrium. And then here it is. So we have umbilical arteries going out, umbilical vein coming back, goes to the ductus venosus on the way to the liver. Now we're hepatic artery, inferior vena cava. We go from the right atrium to the left atrium via the foramenal valley, or we go from the right ventricle, oops, straight up into the aorta through the ductus venosus, or sorry, ductus arteriosus. And it actually remains as a ligament after that. So as soon as the baby is born, the baby takes a huge breath and in that huge breath, it's opening up the lungs and all the dramatic pressure changes that happen at that moment immediately slam shut the, valve, the flap that blocks the foramen ovale. So now we have a fossa ovalis. Then the ductus venosus, ductus venosus and the ductus arteriosus no longer are ducts, meaning escape routes for blood. They then now close up and they become the ligamentum, they become ligaments. So we'll see on the cadaver, you can actually see his ligamentum from the venosus portion. So ligamentum teres, they just call it. Okay. For the test, you will be asked to label a diagram with vessels. You will also be asked to name vessels to and from a location. So it could be like the right ear or left ear, or right thumb, left thumb, or pinky, or the toes, just so that I know that you know like the pathway out and then you know, know the right veins to come back. So you're definitely gonna know. So the way to start is definitely place them, know where they are through that. I don't have any paths through the brain. I'll have like questions of, Name the vessel that's gonna serve the front part of the brain. You know, like anterior cerebral artery. Or which of the following vessels are part of the circle of Willis? Um, which one's not part of the circle of Willis? Or which is the vessel that serves the back part of the brain? So there'll be some questions like that, but not necessarily the path, but what is or isn't in the circle is from there. Um, these other areas, it could be a diagram where I have a body diagram like the one I painted out and I got a couple of arrows. When you name them, you definitely want to do right and left of the person on the picture, not your right and left because it will be opposite and make sure you use artery or vein. The pictures will be black and white so you can tell if it's an artery, if there's a nice little candy cane arch, then you know it's a whole arterial tree. Or if it's two sides coming in on one side, you know you're looking at a venous uh, map. So that's your only guess. It's not gonna be colored red or blue, so just be aware of that. Um, and then you'll have on the multiple choice portion, it'll be questions like blood in the femoral artery is going to go where next? So if you know it's in the femoral, where's the next place? If it's an artery, it's going away. So the answer would be the popliteal artery. 
or same question, blood in the femoral vein is going to go where next? Vein implies it's coming back to the heart, so then the answer would be external iliac artery.